Good day to all. Welcome to the Jesus Centered Live Conference 2021. We are joined today by Dr. Paul Dumal from the University of Asia and the Pacific. Good day, Dr. Dumal. Good day. Yes. Well, Dr. Dumal, you've been asked to speak about the benefits of 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines, which is precisely the anniversary we are celebrating in the country. Now, during the preparations for this fifth centenary, there were many individuals and groups questioning why should we even celebrate the fact that we were colonized 500 years ago. The Philippines evangelization and colonization are definitely intertwined, given that both were done by Spain. But could you enlighten us more about the crucial differences between evangelization and and colonization. I think we need to clarify this first. Well, I think something that's important, first of all, is that there are two meaning colonization. So the first and the older meaning has to do with a group of foreigners in a new land. And so you talk about in the Philippines, no? you, you, you can talk about the colony of Japanese, or a colony of Americans and, and so on. No? Uh, there is this other sense of colonization. Well, in Philippine history, it goes back to the Bourbons. These were the, the royal family of, uh, of France and then afterwards of Spain that ascended the, the Spanish throne in 1700. And for them, colonization meant uh, exploiting a foreign country and its inhabitants for the wealth that they can contribute to the mother country. Now, I think that that second meaning is what most people are aware of. They are not aware of the older meaning, which goes back to Greek and Roman times. If you keep that in mind, well, then it's very difficult to put an equals sign between Christianization in the Philippines and colonization, colonization understood in the second meaning, no? which is the meaning which endured up to the 20th, the 21st century and roundly condemned by people like Karl Marx. No? Because that type of colonization simply did not exist. Of course, you may, you may claim that, well, when the Bourbons came around in 1700, if Christianization and colonization in the first sense had not occurred in the 16th uh, century, then there would have been no opportunity for the second meaning of colonization to happen. No? Well, I'm not going to bother with that because you can also extend it to the colonization of America or, or the invasion that the Japanese had here. No? I mean, the, the chains of cause and effect are, get more and more unwieldy no? the longer the time frame that we, we admit. Okay? Uh, but something I think which could help us to appreciate what happened is how the two, Christianization and then colonization in the first sense, got entangled, so to speak, with each other. And for that, the only thing we can do really is to go to the Pope who had sanctioned the expeditions of Spain uh, to the West. For that, you have to look at Alexander VI and the bull that he wrote addressed to Spain and Portugal. Right? I'm not going to go into great detail because you can Google that. And I don't know if you'll be pleased, but I'm thinking of applying the policy that I have with my students. If you can Google it, I'm not going to talk about it. From reading the document written by the Alexander VI, no? that the only justification he saw for a papal blessing of an exploratory trip was in order to spread the gospel. 
Well, that makes sense, right? Um, was he using spreading the gospel as an excuse to give the Spaniards what they want them? No. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the intentions of his heart uh, were. And I'm putting it that way because if you look at this whole development from the point of view, view of the history of the church traveling to spread the word of of god is absolutely a natural part of its history and everywhere that the early explorers went we're talking about the period of the renaissance no? missionaries came in their wake to start preaching the word of of god no so what I'm saying at this point is that when the Spaniards went to the Pope to ask for his blessing, you know, by that time, the Portuguese had already explored the Atlantic coast of Africa, you know, the Cape of Good Hope, and from India, they, they had passed on to, to, to Southeast Asia. They did not bother to ask the Pope for permission for, for anything. Uh, it was the Spaniards who, who did that. And the reason why the Spaniards did that was because this, the, the Portuguese were very annoyed by the Spaniards moseying in into their territory and, and their business. No? So I guess the Spaniards thought this was a good idea. Why didn't we get a bossing, you know, whom the Portuguese cannot uh, refuse to, to give us permission to explore these, uh, these areas. No? Okay, so another stage in, in this long and complicated answer to your question. If you read the royal in, the, the instructions given to Legaspi in his expedition to the Philippines, uh, you will see that something like 90 or 95% of the document is on trade. It's exploring the territories to see what sort of products are there. It's meeting the natives and finding out if they are friendly or not. It's showing them uh, things made in Spain or Europe to see which would attract them. Uh, 90, 95% on trade. And then there's a little bit on evangelization. And basically where the documents say, uh, find out as well if they would be open to our priests or missionaries preaching to them about God's word. No? And then an even lesser percentage, which says, if they are willing to hear God's word, no? find out if they would also be willing to be vassals of the king of Spain. Now that last part, I think, is the closest we get to what many people have in mind for colonization. I'm giving you these percentages, these proportions of the, these three topics occupy in the instructions to, to Legaspi as an indication of what the Legaspi expedition was, was all about. Trade, first of all. Then second, evangelization. And then in the third place, but contingent on the interest of natives in hearing the word of God. No? In the third place is being vassals to the king of Spain. Now, was that serious? Or is this Pakitan Tao? Well, in 1590, 1591, I believe it was, no? the bishop, the then bishop of Manila, Domingo de Salazar, took the long trip to Madrid to denounce before Philip II no? uh, the fact that the people of Luzon, who were considered vassals, by the Spaniards had been forced to recognize Philip as their king. And Salazar was saying, Hindi pwede yan. Kailangan isoli 
lahat ng kanilang tributes. So that cannot be. You've got to return all the tributes collected with that assumption. So the king and his council, their first reaction was to reject the claims of, um, of Salazar. Salazar died a few months after. And then the, the, the priest who was with him, the friar who was with him, who was Miguel de Benavides, wrote him several memorials, memos about the issue. And it seems that Philip II relented because in 1599, Benavides returned to the Philippines with a royal order. And the royal order was to hold a referendum among all the pueblos in the Philippines and to ask them, do you want to remain as vassals of the King of Spain or not? And if you say no, that's fine. Now I'm going to stop there because as far as our story is concerned, you know, it supports that point about the interests of Spain in the Philippines, you know, trade, evangelization, and then vassalage. You know. But I want to say a few things about vassalage because that relationship of the king being the feudal lord and having vassals. This is something that you could find in Spain and in other parts of Europe, France, etc. No? Because the vassal was basically the ruler, except that he would recognize the power of the, of the Lord through a, a tribute that he would give every so often. And what was the meaning of vassalage? The meaning of vassalage is when we, the vassals, are in trouble, you, the Lord, will come to help us. When you are in trouble, we, the vassals, will go to help you. And that was the kind of arrangement that you had between the Spanish king and the pueblos in the Philippines soon after they began Christianization. So... Is that the same as colonization? I don't think it is. I don't think it is, no? So the question is a little anachronistic. If you are going to apply it to Christianization in the 16th century, but even if you were to apply it to Christianization at a later time, <laughs> there's obviously no connection between the two. No? Right, another indication that we have is the, the Synod of Manila, which was held in 1582. That was called for by Domingo de Salazar and attended mainly by Augustinians and Dominicans. No, I'm sorry, Franciscans, because they were the only missionaries around at that time. But the purpose for holding it was to find out what was going on, gather data, which really meant chronicling all the abuses committed by the Spaniards in the country, the soldiers, the encomenderos, the justice officials, etc., and to report all of these eventually to the king in order to, to demand that he put a stop to it. Now, really, if the purpose is colonization, which means exploitation, eh, hindi ba? Parang, I mean, that seems to be precisely what is being denounced by the Synod of Manila. So it's hard. Well, it's hard because we're using terms anachronistically. Concepts that belong to the 18th century, we're trying to apply them to the 16th. It just doesn't work. Now, by the 1590s, there was a rule, a law that was promulgated in Manila, which was what? Spaniards were prohibited from living of the, of the natives, of Filipinos. And, and people like the encomenderos who were in charge of collecting the tribute were allowed to go to the villages only 
at the designated time when the tribute was to be collected. And then the alcaldes mayores, who were justices, were told to move home within their territory every four months in order to process all of the lawsuits which would be brought by the people. I mean, in other words, you can see that there is an attempt to limit the amount of contact between Filipinos and Spaniards. So the next question is, well, how were they exploiting the Filipinos then? They were not. That's precisely the time of the galleon trade. And the profits of the galleon trade were astronomical. They did not have any need of exploiting any part of the Philippines. Of course, from the point of view of Spaniards, they neglected the Philippines. From the point of view of Filipinos, mabuti nga, tayo-tayo lamang. We're the only ones who took care of our own future. Again, how can you bring in the Marxist understanding of colonization here? Well, let me stop there. Yes. <laughs> Sorry so, that it's so complicated. No, very interesting. Uh, thank you for making that uh, distinction uh, between not only colonization and Christianization, but also between the, the two definitions of colonization. Is it also right to say that it was 500 years ago, 1521, that the gospel was first preached in our islands? And it was only in 1565 that with the arrival of Legazpi, that we technically became a colony of Spain. So even, that's, even that's, in the That's correct. Line, yeah. okay. That is correct. That is correct. And, and, the re, and, and since the people were baptized under the wings of uh, Magellan, eventually lost the faith because <laughs> there were no missionaries to live with them, is the reason why in 1565, when Legazpi came, they had to wait for a go signal from Spain in order to formally begin Christianization. And I think that that must have come from the Augustinians. And the reason was simply, they didn't want apostasy to follow conversion. I mean, something may turn up and then the king may change his mind. Forget it about staying in the Philippines. So it's only in 1570 when the Spaniards with Legazpi found out that they would stay. So. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Okay. As, as a follow-up to our first question, some people ask if we would have been better off if the Spaniards, uh, that's including Christianity, did not arrive. What do you think would have happened to our archipelago, given the history of its neighboring countries, both in insular and peninsular Southeast Asia, if indeed we were never both Christianized and colonized? I guess with this, we will already see the benefits precisely of 500 years of Christianity in our country. Thank yeah. You. Well, in principle, I, as a history teacher, I hate what if questions, uh, but I think it might be an interesting exercise in this case, because quite obviously the Dutch were interested in us and they tried their very best to dislodge the Spaniards in the first half of the, of the 17th century. They did not succeed, but let's assume that they did. Now you have to look at the history of Indonesia. And in the history of Indonesia, I think you would have to make a distinction between the old cultures like Java and Bali and Sumatra and the rest of the archipelago, which were old but not sophisticated cultures. They were more rural, backward, you might say, even in certain parts savage, meaning mga taong gubat. And the Dutch were especially interested in those old cultures, no? Sumatra was the seat of the Sri Vijayan Empire and uh, Java of the Majapahit. The Balinese were their own island, their own little, little empire. No? Um, we would have ended up like, like the backwaters of Indonesia. Walang masyadong papatol sa atin. 
And I don't think we would have attracted them because of spices since we did not have them in great abundance. For sure, what would have happened was that they would have continued the China trade. But the China trade tended to separate the colonizers from the natives. They were not interested in the natives because there were so much, so much, there was so much profit to be made with the, with the China trade. No? So basically what I'm saying is that I think if we fell under the Dutch, no, we would have been more or less abandoned, the villages, the barangays, to our own resources. And I know that there are people who would be very happy about that. No? What's wrong with that? Sabinila. No? If the English came, parang ganun din ang mangyari. Because look at the English in India. I'm not really very familiar with them in Malaysia. But again, the tendency of, of the British was to talk only to the, to the aristocracy who controlled the trade and left the people as they were. Now, why am I bringing all of this up? I'm bringing all of this up because when you study the history of the church in the Philippines, then you see how the missionaries, in order to Christianize the people, lived among them and then taught them how to live in civic communities and basically taught them a lot of civic virtues. You can put it that way. This word is not in vogue anymore. How they civilized them. No, Nako, very politically incorrect. Yan, no? But civilized meaning to get them to live in a city. That's the original meaning of civilized to get them to live in a big community composed of different families. Now, I put it that way because when the Spaniards arrived, the only type of community they found everywhere was the barangay. And the barangays were basically kinship units, meaning the people there were all related or almost all related to one another. These are not civic communities. The civic community comes into being only when you have various families living together under one ruler. If you're in a community where all of you are relatives, what you have really is a, is a kinship unit. It's a, it's a family. And the rules of the family are very different from the rules of a civic community. I mean, there are things that, that the parents can do which would not be allowed in a civic community. So I think what I want to say is that the experience of Christianization in the Philippines was also the experience of civilization, of learning how to live in a civic community, learning how to live with others, with other families and so on. And I don't think we would have had that because uh, the other missionaries, the record that they have is, is not very clear along that line. You know? But in the Philippines, it's very clear. <laughs> so the British would never have done that here. The Dutch would never have done that here either. Yes. <laughs> Well, if anyone who has gone through Philippine secondary education, which requires a lot of anti-Spain, anti-colonial, anti-church literature, will commonly perceive the Spanish friars and missionaries simply as Padre Damasos, who are greedy, abusive villains who cooperated with the harsh colonizers. But how much good did did they all really do, those Spanish missionaries, friars, members of various religious orders, in those 300 plus years they were here, um, and whose fruits we are reaping until today. Could you enlighten us with that? Well, I think the person to enlighten you on that is Nick Joaquin. He has a book, the title is Culture and History, if I'm not mistaken, you can Google it. And he has a wonderful essay precisely on that point. And he says that, tells the story 
much more eloquently than I can. And, and he has a list of 10 things that the Spaniards brought to us, or I, Spaniards, or maybe the missionaries, no? which he says changed our lives in, in the same way that the printing press changed the lives of Europeans, no? or you might say the cell phone. And, and he starts, he starts with the wheel <laughs> that they brought the wheel to the Philippines. And before that, Baladao. I know that one of them again is that they don't taught us how to domesticate carabaos, which is true. The carabao, the early Spanish documents in the Philippines, are described as living wild in the mountains because they were not. They had not yet been domesticated. A third example which he gives, that they introduced us to the plow, Araro. Now, of course, you can say, Teka muna. we've always imagined rural Filipinos as working with the Araro and with the Calabao. And now you're telling me that these came to be a part of our culture only with the arrival of the missionaries? Yes, sir. No, please look for Nick Joaquin for details. No? And he goes through other things. No? Like he says that all of the, the plants that are mentioned in Bahay Kubo, the song, apparently they're all imported. <laughs> they, they were all brought to the Philippines by, by the Spaniards. Uh, Roads. Of course, there were no roads in the Philippines when the Spaniards came. Maps. The same thing. You don't find maps. Um, and others. So I, I don't re remember them. But, but these are, okay, these are modest things. But uh, on the level of, what's the name of the guru of communications? Marshall McLuhan? Yes. It's following the ideas of Marshall McLuhan. Bucky Google. Nobody knows who he is anymore. No? And those are important things. No? They're small, but they change cultures radically. So I would list them among the goods brought over by the, the Spaniards. Because of them, well, our furniture making extended to more furniture, not just the dulang. And then there was work on leather. Leather work starts with the Spaniards. No? All sorts of arts, in spite of what some scholars say, I, I don't think you had theater or drama before the Spaniards came. No? Well, wow. With those uh, maybe just less than a handful of questions, we did learn a lot from you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dumol. As we My know, pleasure. We, yes, as we know, this conference uh, theme is share the joy, something that the Pope has been urging us all to do, to share the gospel joy. And I think to share the joy and to have Jesus at the center of our lives, we should firstly share the truth. And thank you very much for sharing the truth with us as regards 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. Once again, thank you and good day to all. Thank you.